here you can see what happens as I hand several 200 gram weights off of this spring. It stretches more and more and more. And the amount that it stretches is proportional to the weight which I hang off. Robert Hooke came up with a rule to describe this behavior. He said that the force in the spring was propor directly proportional to the distance either stretched or compressed, attempting to restore the equilibrium position. There is a limit to how far we can stretch a spring, and that is called the elastic limit. If we stretch a spring too far past its elastic limit, it will not spring back, and it will become permanently deformed, such as this. This is not a good use of a spring. A material which is plastic is deformable, and when stretched, will maintain that stretched position, whereas an elastic material, when stretched, will regain its original position, past its elastic limit, and a material becomes deformable or plastic. Different springs will have different stiffnesses or stretchinesses. We call it the spring constant, the number that describes the stretchiness of a spring. Just looking at these springs alone, you can see that gravity alone is stretching the spring out a little bit, and the coils are a bit farther apart at the bottom, or at the top, than they are at the bottom. If I hand masses off this, we can see that each of these springs stretches by a different amount. The amount the spring stretches is proportional to the force that's put on it, and that stretchiness is the spring constant. The spring constant, K, of a spring is determined by the material that the spring is made of and the geometry or sh exact shape of the coil. The units for the spring constant are in force per unit length, typically Newton's per unit meter. The force in a spring is proportional to the distance stretched, and if we make a graph of force versus distance stretched, we find a linear relationship. And the slope of this line is our spring constant. Here I have two springs with the same spring constant but different lengths. And the one that is twice as long will stretch twice as much. When we do work to either compress or stretch a spring, we're actually storing elastic potential energy in that spring. If I stretch it just a little bit, we can see I've given it elastic potential energy. If I stretch it twice as far, I can actually see there's four times as much potential energy, and three times as far, nine times as much potential energy. Likewise, if I compress it, I also give it elastic potential energy. If I compress it twice as much, four times as much potential energy. If I compress it three times as much, nine times as much elastic potential energy. Work is the area underneath a force versus displacement graph. We can also use this to calculate the amount of potential energy in a spring. The area of this shape is a triangle, and the area of a triangle is one-half base times the height. In this case, the height is the force, and the base is the distance stretched or compressed. So one-half times the force times the change in x. We substitute in our definition with Hooke's law for force, and we wind up with one-half k x squared as a formula for the potential energy stored in a spring. A system where the restoring force is linear and the potential energy function is quadratic is called a harmonic oscillator. We can set a spring into vibratory motion and we call this simple harmonic motion. The equilibrium point is in the middle. And there are extrema when we either compress the spring or stretch the spring. When we either stretch or compress the spring, we have elastic potential energy. And all that elastic potential energy becomes kinetic energy at the equilibrium point. So as it oscillates back and forth, at the extrema, we have elastic potential energy. And in the middle, all that elastic potential energy becomes kinetic. Here again, we can see 
as the spring oscillates back and forth, the potential energy that we have given it changes into kinetic energy. And it oscillates back and forth between potential and kinetic. At the equilibrium position in the center, all the energy is in the form of kinetic energy. And at the extrema, all the energy is in the form of elastic potential energy. The distance between the equilibrium position and the extrema is called the amplitude. This oscillating back and forth of the spring might remind you of the x-coordinate position of a ladybug sitting on a turntable. The x-position, as we remember, forms a sine wave. In this simulation, we overlap an oscillating spring and a ball going in a circle. And we can see that the motions of the ball moving in the circle and its x-coordinate are identical to the motion of the box on the end of the spring. The radius of that circle is equal to the amplitude of the vibrations. Using conservation of energy, we can derive an equation for the period of oscillation of a spring. The kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. The potential energy is 1 half k delta x squared. And remember, the tangential velocity is 2 pi times the radius divided by the period of a circle. We saw that the radius of that circle is equal to the amplitude of our vibrations. So what we do is we substitute in for our maximum potential energy, 1 half k delta x squared, or a being amplitude, 1 half ka squared. The maximum kinetic energy is going to be 1 half times the mass times the maximum velocity squared. We constantly have kinetic energy and potential energy sloshing back and forth, and the maximum of each are going to be equal to each other if total energy is conserved. So 1 half ka squared is equal to 1 half mv squared. The 1 halves cancel, and we wind up with a squared over v squared is equal to m over k. We take the square root of both sides, and we wind up with a over v is equal to the square root of m over k. Now, we'll take our definition of tangential velocity and substitute that in for v. So we have 2 pi times the amplitude over the period. And that's equal to the square root of m over k. And what we'll find is that the amplitude cancels out of this equation, leaving us with an equation for the period t divided by 2 pi is equal to the square root of m over k. We can now isolate the period of oscillation of our spring as 2 pi times the square root of m over k. So the spring oscillates back and forth with a certain period. And that period is determined by the mass and the spring constant. This oscillation, as a position as a function of time, takes the form of a sine or a cosine function. By examining rotational motion, we can figure out why this is. If we draw a unit circle, and we have the coordinates x and y on the unit circle, and an angle theta, and a radius a of the circle, the x-coordinate is a cosine theta, and the y-coordinate is a sine theta. The angular speed is the change in angle over change in time. So we can give the angular position as equal to the angular speed times time. Thus, we can make a substitution that x is equal to the amplitude or radius of the circle times the cosine of omega t. Now, we can also define the angular speed as 2 pi times the linear frequency, or 2 pi over the period. Remember, angular speed is measured in radians or degrees per second, whereas frequency is measured in revolutions or cycles per second. We can thus express the position x as a function of time, where our constant is either the frequency or the period. Now, the main difference between a sine and cosine is that they're just shifted over by what we call a phase shift. And we can add a phase shift into our equation. The phase shift is represented by phi. The spring is a great model for simple harmonic motion in nature. Whenever the restoring force is linearly proportional to the displacement, we have an oscillatory motion. And the angular frequency or period of this motion depends on the spring constant and the mass. and can be given by the equation, the period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m over k.